So commoditization, it's a reality for all of us. It's not something pleasant, but it is something we have to uh, reckon with. And the first observation I would make is that in strategy, we used to think about the world as being relatively stable. Uh, so that, you know, you got a competitive advantage, you put it into place, and you were able to enjoy that advantage for a really long period of time. And what we're finding is that a lot of the entry barriers that once made that way of thinking about the world have come down. So it's now vastly cheaper, vastly easier competitors to match what you're doing. So we used to think of competitive advantage as being a relatively durable thing. So you needed innovation every once in a while, but once you got a stable advantage in place, um, your job was basically to exploit, to operate with efficiency, to extend that advantage as long as you possibly could. And one of the things that's happened as entry barriers have come down, as digitization has made everything faster and cheaper and easier to use, is that competitive advantages today are much more like a wave where you create an advantage, you have a period of time in which you get to exploit it, and then it comes under pressure. This is the commoditization trap where competitors will copy you if they can, or they'll match you, you know, with some offering of their own that does functionally the same thing yours does. My point is that your advantage comes under pressure and can actually erode. And what you're seeing is a pattern like this one uh, from the gaming business. And uh, if you look at 20 or 30 years of history in the gaming business, what you see is it started with arcade games. That's all there was. You had to go to a physical place and throw money into a ref refrigerator sized machine. And it was analog, right? So the game itself was pulleys and flips and levers. We didn't have the concept of software yet. So the next big innovation was we separated out the intelligence of the game from the game itself. And that led to big innovations like dedicated game players, uh, games you could take with you in a portable form, games played on color screens. Whoa, that was a big deal. Games played on general purpose equipment. And of course, today we have games that are played with virtual reality headsets, games played in, in phones, games played in auto automated reality. Um, and my point is that this is the pattern that we increasingly are seeing when we're thinking about our competitive advantages. So we need to get a lot more comfortable with the fact that we need to continuously innovate. So if the world outside your organization looks like this, the world inside your organization needs to look like that too. So we need to continuously innovate. We need to exploit. Of course, that's important. That's where you get paid back for all your hard work. But we also need to be attuned to the risk that once we've been out in the market and we've demonstrated something's possible, competitors are likely to catch up. And one of the fundamental problems that we face is that this creates a spiral, right? We begin with a profitable, unique brand Brand, which has all kinds of selling features and nobody else can copy us. But as we're out in the market, as observers kind of look, they can sometimes copy us. And sometimes they can copy without actually having to make the investment in the innovations that caused this brilliant new thing to be popular in the world. And so you can end up with an unprofitable commoditizing business. And it's a very natural thing that happens if you have markets that are open to competition. And the big problem for dealing with this inside a large organization is you have this imbalance, right? You've got these tiny little new things that are the future competitive advantage trying to cope with the big established weight of the existing business. And you can see it's very, very unbalanced. So what should you be looking at to know if you're at risk? of uh, a commoditization. If you think you know something about what you're doing might be copied or might become less and less uh, relevant. So I think a good set of indicators are the ones on this list. So our own people aren't buying our products. Um, cheaper solutions are considered good enough by most customers. Competition's coming from somewhere unexpected. You mean all of a sudden apples and hearing aids, you know, that kind of thing. Customers aren't excited. Our people aren't excited. People are leaving us to go to other places. Uh, headhunters are having good luck recruiting for us. Technical people are saying, ah, you know, that's yesterday's technology. It's no longer at the frontier. Very few innovations have made it to market. Management is in denial. But I think the big warning is we're investing at the same level 
or even more, but we're not seeing returns. And this is exactly the conundrum that faced Dow Corning uh, in their silicates business. And so what they had, uh, as they were very successful, they're a very successful company, but what they found they had for their core silicon business was four market segments. So the first market segment was their perfect customer, right? We love all the science. We love the innovation. Give it to us. Customize, you know, six ways to Sunday. That's great. Super high margins, super challenging technologically. That was really good. So that was the first segment. Second segment were people that basically bought Dow Corning because they wanted an assurance of quality. They wanted the brand name to reassure everybody. And the Dow Corning did really well with those two segments, but there were two more segments that Dow wasn't doing so well with and that actually represented a real threat to the business. The third segment were people who just wanted a standard price for a standard offering, right? I mean, I'll pay you, but why do I have to pay you innovation, creativity kind of prices when all I really want is two tons of this stuff delivered to my doorstep every other Thursday, right? <laughs> That's all I want. Very standard, very straightforward. And then the last segment were pure price takers. These were people who would go for the cheapest amount of price you know, that they could find from any provider anywhere in the globe, and Dow couldn't even serve those. Now, they could have made a strategic choice to say that's just life, we're going to focus on those first two segments, but their bigger concern was if they let those low-end competitors come in, that they would be facing the innovator's dilemma, and that they would be in a situation where eventually those competitors would improve their capabilities and start eating into Dow's core market. It's a real commoditization problem, right? Um, and so what they decided to do was face commoditization head on. And their CEO said, okay, you know, we're going to have a half the company. We're going to split the company. We're going to have our cost. That was the mental model. They called it Xiameter to evoke the idea of diameter, you know, cutting our costs in half. And he had his team go through every single thing that added cost or complexity or time to the Dow offering and figure out a way to strip those out. And then they went back to market with an offering that basically said to those third and fourth customers, okay, we heard you. You want it cheaper. You want it standard. It let's us tell you how you can get that. You can get that if you pay us up front. You can get that if you don't interact with our people. You're going to interact with a robot. We're going to tell you what size shipments you're allowed to have and a whole laundry list of other things that added cost and complexity, which was only worth doing at the top of the market, right? Uh, today, what they've done, and this is a really creative use of the concept of commoditization, is they've now embedded the idea of commoditization into uh, the way that they manage their product life cycles. So brand new things start at the top, right? These are the co-creation with customers. We're going to make the latest, greatest application of silicon you could possibly have. Some of those things are going to be relevant to that second segment that just we need we need the trusted brand. And then eventually, as commoditization creeps in, that offering goes from being branded Dow Corning to being branded Xiameter, and then it goes into that line of business. And so they've actually embraced the idea of commoditization as part of their business strategy. It's been a really smart to me use of uh, understanding that concept. And so effectively what they've done is they've created a context in which the new thing doesn't have to fight, you know, doesn't have to fight the heavy weight of the old thing, because we've said we know the old thing is gonna get commoditized. We have to balance between the two. So we'll be talking about this more uh, in other lessons, but for now, a couple of key learning points. Any product in a competitive market that isn't protected by some major entry barrier is going to face the challenge of commoditization. Uh, you can't avoid it. Uh, and that what you need to be thinking of doing is creating a vibrant pipeline of innovations so that the new ones can replace the old ones that are fading away. So that's today's lesson. Uh, there will be a lot more to come. Uh, this is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have further questions or you'd like to learn more. Thank you very much.